Real Talk. Real estate investing the right way. Brought to you by Central Indiana's premier real estate investors association. Cyria. Check out upcoming guests weekly on the calendar of events at www.cyria.org. And welcome to Real Talk. This is the only local real estate investing radio show where active investors discuss real estate investing done the right way every Saturday and Sunday from noon until 1 p.m. I'm Ron Watson, president of the board of directors of Cyria and your host for the program today. We're going to be discussing some of the headlines that are affecting the real estate investing world. And you can check out how to contact each of our co-hosts on our website at Cyria.club and find out how to reference some of the materials we're talking about today as well. Joining me in the studio today is three of the top investors in Central Indiana. First is Dave Short with Century 21 Sheets. Dave's an investor, a realtor, a coach, mentor, and one of the most sought after rehabbers in Central Indiana. Welcome back, Dave. Great to be here. And Brian Snyder, Operations Manager for Simple Wholesaling, one of the top wholesalers in the state of Indiana. Welcome, Brian. Thanks, Ron. Joining us also is Sterling Davis, owner of Athosity Property Management and Vice President of the Cyria Board of Directors. Hello. Hello, Hello there, Sterling. How are you doing today? I am good. <laughs> awesome. So, three news stories we wanted to share briefly with the listeners, and then we've got a topic of really specific local interest I thought we would dig into. There was some information about U.S. ownership and rental vacancy rates holding firm over the United... This is kind of a broad... Uh, article over the rest of the country national media median rent is up and predictions for 2019 were not slowing down yes stabilizing that's exciting right so we the reason i just thought we'd mention that very briefly and i don't want to go into a lot of detail on these but you know there's always the, there's this um uh mention out there of potentially the market slowing down and maybe a you know another recession or whatever it might be uh coming at us and um, you know, I, I'm not saying that. I think we've talked about that on the show before, but um, things are going well here in Central Indiana. That's really the key. Yeah. And I think if you look around the city and if you go driving around the area and see all the projects and the works and all the new development, not just in Indianapolis but even the suburbs, um, you have a pretty good feeling for bright futures for us for a little while at least. Now, this is a local article I thought we'd mention. This is about using Airbnb as income for refinancing your mortgage so that's kind of cool this is um you know it's a it's a if, if you have a property and you're using that property and you're, you're leasing it out to uh, airbnb folks so that you can now use that income as proof of income and people like quicken loan citizens bank uh, other mortgage companies are accepting that as uh you know valid income for you so uh, that's kind of interesting and i know we have a lot of airbnb things happening locally in our particular area so i thought we'd start off the conversation with that dave uh, what are your thoughts on that is that is that kind of exciting well or? it's exciting it kind of surprises me a little bit but uh you know once fannie mae gets into it um which buys probably 70 percent of the mortgages in the country then all the other lenders will quickly come on board because it will be an acceptable uh, acceptable income income stream so and the uh, Airbnbs I think we're going to see more and more of those as people try to get into houses that maybe really stretches their budget and if they can see Airbnb as a as a source of additional funds to to help them make their house payment it, it's going to mean a lot I mean we're you know the Airbnb specialist in Indianapolis is uh, Elizabeth Sickle and she's giving me information that uh, it's pretty easy to keep a room rented or a you know uh, half of a double rented to Airbnb type people in 15 16 days per month so the house doesn't get the beat up that uh, that it maybe a normal rental would get on a piece of property so starts to make a you know starts to make a lot of sense yeah I think you know I find it interesting because I feel like um, Airbnb uh, locally has became like the 
the marijuana of like other areas. <laughs> like, and I is it that, legal you know, or not? Right? Go to drugs, like, man. Like, exactly. <laughs> like, is it legal or is it not? Like, you know what I mean? Like, is it good for the community or is it bad for the community? Right. right? Like, you know what I mean? And and it becomes this this big debate, and it it becomes paralyzing to a certain degree. Um, and that's why, like, seeing that banks and things are are willing to refinance i think is a step forward Mm -hmm. for the progressiveness of and the the solidifying of airbnbs and and rentals yeah i think for so long it's just kind of one of those things of like airbnb was just kind of out there like hey what's what's going to happen with it is this going to is this going to work is it not going to work uh as far as you know, being able to include your income and things like that. It was just kind of out there as far as even like laws here in Indianapolis. It's still kind of like, oh, let's wait a little bit longer and see how it progresses and see how much it takes over. And then we'll kind of figure something out. But yeah, I talked to Elizabeth Sickles three years ago, I think about this. And I was like the grumpy old man was like, no, this would never work. <laughs> I'm like technology. No. And now like three years later, like her company's growing and it's making dough. And I was like, Maybe I missed a boat on this. (laughs) Well, we're looking at so much of the, um, uh, at least the communities now are are at least starting to take a wait-and-see attitude. Uh, Communities, governments tend to, okay, we've got two or three loud people in the council that don't like this for lack of knowledge. So at least a lot of the communities today are, are seeing it as a positive because, you know, if somebody comes into a a house in fishers to stay for three or four days then you know what they're eating out uh, at the restaurants they're visiting movie theaters at the restaurants they're going to shows at the music center so they're spending money in our economy and they're not abusing the house that they're in or they won't be part of the program anymore yeah and i mean there's a i mean Airbnbs are, it's really cool to watch just the progression of Airbnbs over the last couple of years here in Indianapolis, just because, I mean, I can remember, you know, even two years ago when a lot of just local people were buying and just thinking about doing Airbnb and just kind of putting it out there a little bit. But now we have actually people contacting us, just investors from Las Vegas, California, or anywhere out there like that, that want to invest in Indianapolis just for Airbnb purposes. So it's not just the local people now, too, that are investing in Indianapolis. It's also, you know, throughout the country that, because they know, Indianapolis has a product of that people want to come stay here. There is there's something here as far as um, just everything that's going on in the city. There's a lot of cool places where you can stay and just like kind of hang out. Or I know even too that a lot of the Airbnbs are um, people are staying them here in Indianapolis. They're just doing staycations. Uh, people from up in Carmel or Fisher and they'll go downtown to stay at an Airbnb for a couple of days and just hang out in the local you know, the local areas. So they are always they're very heavily occupied throughout Indianapolis. I guess what I'm curious about, it says Airbnb supplies its hosts with proof of income statement that hosts can now include when applying with these loans and things. Um, in, in, in Elizabeth Sickles' situation, she's a super host. Mm-hmm. So she's not necessarily the homeowner, but she's a third party member. Is If they're providing income statements to the host, does that go directly to the homeowner or does that go to Elizabeth Sickles for the refinancing of the property? Does that make sense? Well, she's basically going to give verification on the, uh, on the loan to help them be able to get a loan, her, her person coming in. And she's going to have a history on that house that she can provide to a lender that say, yeah, we can, we can keep this house rented for 15 days and we have for the last two years. A month and here's the income that we got which makes a refinance substantially easier for that person coming in and and just giving them their records they have a documented third party mm-hmm. giving them records gotcha. so that makes it, that that makes it so much easier yeah oh, it, it would help mm-hmm. it would help tremendously and you know what I like about the Airbnb model and you know I, I have a good friend that had two really large houses in Fountain Square that he couldn't sell you know they were worth the value but nobody was buying them he turned both of them into airbnbs and he's actually increased the value of his house because of the cash flows i mean think about it from a corporate person coming in if they have to get four rooms for 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 their sales reps at at jw during a convention he's going to spend probably two thousand dollars a night to get those rooms he can rent my friend's airbnb 
for 600 a night and and save almost six or seven thousand dollars and give them better i shouldn't say better because jdep is pretty nice right. yeah <laughs> that's uh, not bad no it's okay yeah <laughs> well i think the thing what i find fascinating is it, i mean it's twofold right it's been times in in the last couple of years that i have told people specifically i'm not the person for you you probably are better off going to a third party person that specializes in airbnb because your rent is uh downtown on mass avenue 1800 versus if you did an airbnb it could be three times that right and i think the second thing is i find fascinating like i was talking to one of the city officials and he was telling me he said sterling uh, um these big hotels that are being built and you know like we talk about the jw he said they're really only full about four times a year mm -hmm. he's like they're really only full four times a year where what we see with airbnbs they're, they're full multiple times throughout that month to be able to sustain that income where a lot of these big hotels are, are built off of very specific conventions and things that are coming into indiana and then outside of that you know the money and revenue has not really been made well i've heard and, and i don't know this uh, we could find out for you but there's 27 to 30 days a year that are high priced airbnb nights in india in indianapolis because of the conventions where it's a minimum three to four days stay to to rent it at typically three to four times what normal nightly rates would be Oh, yeah. Sterling, do you have people that uh, I'm just curious if you have anybody that, you know, you're managing their property for that, like, have maybe gone away from you guys because they wanted to turn it to an Airbnb or have asked you guys, to, you know, if you offer that service for them? Or? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, and, and it's just I, I think you have to know what you're great at. You know, I mean, we're not uh, a shop for everything. Right. Like we do not specialize on Airbnb. Airbnb is uh, more hospitality and it's more high touch. Um, so we're just not equipped to be able to put it on. So, yeah, we have a lot of people. Most of it comes to, like I, what I was saying, like that central downtown area. Mm -hmm. It's been homes. Like it was a home that I couldn't sell um, uh, late last year, late summer last year. And I was like, you can make $8,000. Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, and I, we'll, we'll get Elizabeth in here again on, on the show. I know she's been in here before. Probably it's been a while. So. I know there's a lot of interest in this topic. Last week on the program, we talked about the difference between private money and hard money. And at our April 4th meeting, we're going to have a panel of local experts who will discuss creative financing for their projects. And uh, so, and this is different than private money or hard money. It's, it's creative financing strategies um, subject to lease own options, rent to buy, um, rent to own, exp land contracts, that kind of thing. So I thought we'd uh, finish up this segment of the program and then probably a couple more segments talking about some of these creative financing uh, options and deals uh, and I know Dave you could write a book about this probably uh, and we're all waiting for that book if, you, if you'll deals, get started on it deals and deals. <laughs> deals 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 with public Dave. school I'm not a good writer <laughs> well you could dictate it uh, but maybe start off uh, with some some uh, you know a couple of these strategies i don't know lease option though you've worked on those land land contracts that kind of thing the atypical uh deal that a real estate investor might have an interest in well when we talk uh, uh creative financing or uh, creative opportunities is is you know when we look at a transaction or a house that we would want to buy sometimes there's ways we can buy it sometimes there's ways that we can't uh and but we always try to figure out okay what's the way I can get in this house one of them is uh, lease options um, where you know a seller doesn't need all of his money today to go in uh, to to sell his house and he's looking more and I'll use the term band-aid he's looking more to put a band-aid on his cash flow issues he has with the house he needs to move out of state and he don't want to lose the house he don't want a foreclosure but he owes too much on the house to sell it, where he may lease option it to either an end user or somebody that's going to lease option it to somebody else. You know, and, and you know, when a seller gets into that scenario of putting a Band-Aid on his house, he needs to make sure he can live with the Band-Aid that he's putting on the house. Mm -hmm. And we get so many of these lease options where you know we help them we solve their problem and then 
all of a sudden, you know, they don't like the solution six months later, but maybe they've got into a solution that's going to be a year or two years down the road where he didn't get proper advice to do it. And, you know, we're a really good operator if we do that. We explain all the pitfalls that's that what he's going to do with somebody or do with this particular house and what all the ramification may or may not be. So we tend not to have those issues if we do a lease option. But it is, it is, it's pretty astounding that you still explain all the stuff to, to oh, a yeah. seller and still they're not happy with it and you didn't do right by them and this kind of thing when they've signed the paperwork and said, hey, this is what we've done. Right. So consequently, because of that, we don't do very many. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but there, there's a lot of people out there that do them and do them very, you know, very well. Yes. Anybody else had any experiences with that? I own, uh, I own eight uh, rent to buys, which is a little bit different from lease options. So, my rent to buys, uh, how I honestly it started my investing career. Um, it was an opportunity where uh, a family member needed to get out of some homes um, really, really quick. Um, really need to get moved from his name to someone else's just because he had a business. It was it was it was an opportunity, right? Uh, so I did it, and kind of what Dave said, we we spelled out the terms, and and since then I've learned a lot from it. Like I, I learned um, what made a good rent to buy situation versus a bad one when it came down to because what we were using it for is cash flow. Like that's how I base mines. Um, so it was very important for me to get a. Uh, the rent to buy scenario where it was 50% my expenses to rent. Um, so if the rent was, the gauge was, if my uh, rent could be 700, I needed to at least be with a mortgage, taxes, insurance, and everything, roughly around like three, 300, 325, somewhere around that. Um, just because that helps the cash flow. Like you need to make sure that your cash flow is, is, is not hindered by uh, these rent to buy situations. And for him, what he kind of told me was, he was like, Sterling, I'd rather have guaranteed rents every month than have more rent. Like, and I was like, oh, this this wins. So he took, you know, a $300 mortgage each month and I, I kind of made everything on top of that. Okay, so you basically worked on the spread. Yeah. So that's what we had. We have um, a handful of lease options that we have done and stuff. And, and a lot of times it was you know, the scenarios where somebody maybe didn't have enough pay, enough of a down payment to do a, can, a land contract or a note and mortgage or something like that. So they kind of just needed a little bit of help. So we kind of put them on a lease option program where essentially, um, you know, they kind of put it down a small down payment, but then they're, you know, they're paying rent each month. Uh, a little bit goes towards rent, a little bit goes towards principal. Um, and then we'll have like a reevaluation process after two years. Um, so we kind of handle it that way. But you know, you have that, you know, you have the rent coming in and stuff to help out with that well, as well. But you had but control when you did that. You had control of the property. We have control of the property. Yeah. 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 Okay. So. so have you ever done has simple wholesaling ever lease option from a seller that, that we have you not? Have? So we have not bought you know that way. That's what only when we were. Is that what you're asking? Yes. Yeah. So we've only yeah we've only sold it that way or yeah. you know rented to so, or sold it okay. you know put in that category. But we have never bought. That, um, that's a great question. Way. That's a great question. So we I was buying the situation where Brian saying right. is he is the he's, one he's, that is he's the seller. He's the yeah. seller on it. Well, I've been on both sides of it where you know I, I I'll do some lease options today or I'll buy the house subject to the, mm -hmm. me taking over a mortgage. And there's some legalities there that you have to be careful and some risks that you have to know what you're getting into, you know, when you do that. And uh, so because yeah, you don't want somebody like, especially with the rent to buy, stop paying the taxes. <laughs> and then, you know, what I mean, now your house is a tax sale, yeah. <laughs> you know, what I mean, because you thought this person was paying all the bills. Right. Like, you know, what I mean, um, which can be very now we we will buy properties subject to and stuff so we do do that which we can obviously get into yeah, in the yeah. next section yeah. well I just we have about thirty seconds I just wanted to finish the topic of lease option with the question do you typically I think Brian you mentioned uh, they have a a bit of a down payment up front and then you do you do a reevaluation after a couple of years is the the goal there is that they're going to buy the house then or yeah, what? a couple different <laughs> options they can basically they can just ex extend the lease option and just continue doing that for another two years or whatever um they can go ahead and buy the house outright 
Um, we can put them in a situation if they pay a certain percentage down that we convert it to like a, a note and mortgage okay. and sell to them that way. Or they could honestly, at that point too, they could just walk away and not, and then we just keep every money that all the money they paid and just and walk away. go again with yep. somebody else. Okay, good. Well, let's take a quick break here. I know there's a lot more creative financing techniques that I wanted to talk about uh, in this segment of the program. So uh, we'll take a break and come back after this message. Midwest Garage Door Systems, Real Talk's premium sponsor, is a locally and family-owned business, answering your garage door repair and replacement needs for over 30 years in central Indiana. Doing business the right way is what Midwest is all about. Check out MidwestGarageDoors.com or call 317-449-8440, 317-449-8440. Are you looking for a new place for lunch or dinner or a fun place to hold your next company party? Check out Trader's Mill Grill and Bar. Awesome, friendly staff, fabulous food made from scratch. Full bar and daily drink specials. Make it an evening with more than 20 screens to get your favorite games, including Golden Tea. Also has three pool tables. You can find their menu and hours at TraderMill.com. Check out Trader's Mill Grill and Bar located at 5650. West 86th Street, Indianapolis, Indiana. Do you have a house that you want to sell, but you don't want to fix it up before you sell it? Are you need the cash quickly? Are you just inherit Aunt Susie's house and don't know what to do with it? That's what Dave Short does. He buys houses so you can get on with your life. He pays cash, closes quickly, and buys in all central Indiana. For details, call Dave at 317-590-4499 or email Dave at bshort at c21sheets.com. That's spelled c 21 s c H E E T Z dot com. And welcome back to Real Talk. My name is Ron Watson, president of the board of directors of Cyria. And in the studio today is Dave Short, Brian Snyder, and Sterling Davis. We wanted to uh, continue the, the discussion about creative financing. And actually, sometimes the stories we have on the breaks are more interesting than the ones we can put on air. But <laughs> they are. <laughs> they, would have, they might have to be censored. Every now They'd have now. to be censored. That's the uh, X rated version. You can find that on somewhere else. But uh, anyway. Um, with respect to a topic that was mentioned briefly, and I know, Dave, you're doing some of these kind of deals, the subject to, can you explain what that is and where that might make sense for somebody? Well, we buy uh, several flips a year subject to, and what that means is if, if I have a, I'm taking a mortgage subject to that mortgage staying in place and I'm going to make the payments on that house until I sell it. Now, I, there's a lot of people and companies out there that buy subject to for long-term holds. I don't do that. I buy subject to if I'm going to do a, a maybe a flip on it. And one of the reasons I do that is, is that a lot of times my cost of capital to do a bigger transaction, like if I wanted to do a $200,000 transaction and I was going to have to bring $200,000 in capital where, you know, it, and they maybe have a $150,000 mortgage so their mortgage might only be four percent at one hundred and fifty thousand dollars and if i can make those payments and not have to bring that additional hundred uh, hundred and fifty thousand dollars it might make my uh, transaction look a lot more profitable to me which means i can maybe give the seller a little more money when i buy the house so it makes some sense to then i'm going to be rehabbing the house and and paying that mortgage off within six or seven months and you're not sucking up some of your own cash and i'm not sucking up i can do you know i can have maybe fifty or sixty thousand dollars in that transaction and my cost of funds drops drastically for my for my transaction and it solves my problem with capital it solves the seller's problem is that they've got their funds and they're moving on and I will pay that mortgage off within, I'll typically go in, enter into a contract that I'll pay it off within six months to a year. So it lets me, would let a newbie do more, more flips or maybe do their first flip if there's, if there's funds available. And that's, that's part of the um, education process in, in finding everything out about your seller before you make them an offer Mm -hmm. because your your job as a flipper to buy a house is to solve the problem of the seller so if you're dealing one-on-one with that person in in a deal like you're describing then 
the seller must be in a situation where maybe the there's some deferred maintenance on the property or something, or there's no, some no, reason they can't sell typical. it. Typical. Every once in a while, you'll find something that doesn't have, you know, deferred maintenance. And I mean, there's there's you know the beauty with our business and what makes it so much fun is that you know there's there's a different solution for every every problem that we mm-hmm. that we all in, encounter you know it's kind of like uh, why people sell to to brian you know or you know why people sell to sterling because they have already got a renter in place and they don't want to deal with it so they'll sell it to him to you know to stop the problem stop the bleeding for instance most of it has to do with what i call bleeding there, there's, there's, there's blood involved somewhere there's blood involved <laughs> right. somewhere where people need to need to move something we did one where you know, uh, the gal needed to be in Atlanta in two weeks. And the the transaction fell apart on her house with a traditional broker. So they called us and say, look, we need to net this amount of money. Can you make that happen? Well, I can only make it happen if you let me take over this mortgage for six months and then I'll pay it off. Mm-hmm. So it creates typically a good situation for the seller and a good situation for me. Yeah, and every I mean every situation is different. I think Dave brings a good point about that. It's it's just talking to the seller and figuring out what their situation is and what they what they want out of it. Um, so we'll buy a lot of properties on subject to um, you know so we'll buy it subject to the mortgage. Where we'll take over their mortgage payments because a lot of times when you're talking to that seller, you're just kind of figuring out what they what they want, what they need. Um, so sometimes uh, if we can buy a property subject to number one, we would like we prefer that because it doesn't suck up our cash like we said. Um, and usually the interest rate's a little bit lower. But a lot of times for the seller, if we're buying a subject two, we might be actually be able to offer them a little bit higher price um, on it than we would if we were actually just buying it at cash and outright. You, and more times than not, I, I, I don't know about your situation, but mine would be is uh, more times than not, they're five or six payments behind. Mm-hmm. So we're immediately making up those payments and reestablishing their credit. Mm-hmm. And we're actually, as we're making the payments on this mortgage over time, we're actually helping that seller reestablish their credit. That's a that's a such a blessing, right? I mean, I think uh, what I find interesting is um, I am a, a second generation real estate broker, and my parents have dealt in like just traditional real estate. And I always find it so interesting um, when I started being a member of Syria of just of how to look at deals. Like I, I think growing up, I looked at deals as a very singular way, right? Like. You, you list it, you sell it. You list it, you sell it. Right, and same with me. I, that's why I always describe my creative process of buying <laughs> rental properties. <laughs> you know, I went to a bank, I got a mortgage, I put yeah. some money down, and that's what I did. But uh, being involved with Syria has taught me that there's a lot more to it. Yeah. But, but I did have a question about the subject, too, for you gentlemen, and that is uh, the mortgage exists already on that property, right? So you're not really getting any approval from that mortgage company to take over the loan, right? That, right. That and works? You know, that's correct. Okay. Um, and the mortgages, you know, quite honestly, more times than not, the mortgages that we take over potentially could have a due on sale clause mm-hmm. on it. And the lender could say, hey, you can't do that. Right. We want our money. So that's, you know, that could happen. And we're always prepared. If that would happen, then we would we would get some capital and go pay that that mortgage off. We're... A lot of guys who have 10 or 15 of these, if that happened to them, they potentially couldn't do that. So that's why we do it on a just a, a random, you know, not all the time basis on, on the property. But, I mean, I will say in, um, you know, 40 years of doing this, I've only seen two lenders make the call and say, we want our money back. Hmm. Yeah. And uh, we solve the problem immediately when that when that happened, but it was small. It was smaller banks right. who mm-hmm. managed their own money and had their own money in what we call warehouse. And what they, the, what they're worried about is that 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 mortgage payment just gets made. Which if you're yes. buying something too, it's right. Made, More, or you're, you're making up exactly. for the ones that are you know. That's what I was stuff, thinking. So. Most of the mortgage companies are just happy if you're making the back payments, right. <laughs> they're catching them up, and they're getting money now. Yeah. They're not going to complain too much generally well, about why that. Why doesn't make, anybody it, do that to my student loans? Like yeah. nobody. Just, it doesn't make sense for them to come after the money if the loan's current. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's not right. saying that they can't. Right, it, right, right. Uh, sure. It doesn't it doesn't make sense, and it hasn't. It really hasn't happened. Yeah. 
I will put a little plug in here. So I know that we're going to be talking about this kind of stuff on the April 4th meeting uh, at Cyrie and stuff. But one of our guys from our team, our acquisitions manager, uh, Ronnie Reese, is going to be on the panel talking about subject twos. And he is he like his is a great art form of being able to talk to the sellers and make them sure they understand what's going on and things like that, because obviously a seller, a lot of times he's they're going to want the cash up front. There's going to be, well, why don't you just buy my house and get out from underneath it? But going back to that situation, if we're able to, you know, buy it subject to possibly get them a little bit more and even maybe giving them some walking money as well um, to get out of the deal to sell it to the subject to um, knowing that their house might get paid is their mortgage is going to get paid off in you know, a month or two down the road, whatever it may be. Like he ha he does a great job of explaining that to them, and he's gonna bring some insight to the uh, to the panel on uh, April fourth. So I look well, forward to that. Well, I mean, he has such a wonderful name, Ronnie Reese. Like, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, like you know, what I mean? like let's be real. Like, I, I want to listen to that. Yeah, guy. I want to listen to that guy. I trust whatever Ronnie Reese is selling. I hired him just for his name. <laughs> yeah, <so>. exactly. <laughs> Sorry, sorry. Let's get back on track here. No, no, but I, I think we're not off track. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, sorry, I got distracted. I will, I, I will say one thing though. I did because I, I do think it's just as important to talk about maybe mistakes is you know learning from your mistakes and learning from failures versus just kind of talking about these topics. And we actually, at one point, this was before me, so I can tell the story without you know, having to say it's my fault or anything. Yeah, like that, but, yeah. Um, the other guy. So in the past, they, uh, we bought a property subject to, um, but then we also sold it subject to not a good idea because you're relying basically on that other person to the same so it's the same insecurities property. that that person had about yeah. you paying their mortgage which you're you uh -huh. know you're that they are you know we put ourselves in that situation of course something happened and it, you know they're <laughs> they're not doing a great job of paying oh, that mortgage yeah. and we have to step in sometimes like that so i would not recommend that situation no i, I think that's the same thing with uh uh, when I started doing my land contracts and stuff like that, all the positive stuff, like it, it went great. But I really didn't do a great job of due diligence and learning about land contract. I just saw an opportunity. I was an entrepreneur and I just jumped into it. And like, l luckily, um, it hasn't bit me and it was a great deal. But I'm like, that could have easily went this, uh, a different way. Like my wife was nervous when I was like, yeah, I'm buying, buying these seven properties. She's like, what? No, you know nothing about it. I'm like, I'll figure it out. <laughs> just don't tell her. Just don't tell her. Just ask for forgiveness. <laughs> uh, I feel like at this point we should put a disclaimer out there to always inform your wife <laughs> about what exactly you're doing out there. Now, you mentioned land contracts. So uh, next week we'll have Justin Bogard with us to talk about turning land contracts into more secure mortgages. So we won't get into a lot of detail about that just today. But I know there's a number of other creative financing options uh, that we're going to talk about at our next meeting. And I know you guys have run into, so I, I thought we'd take a quick break here and get back and do some more of those uh, options and uh, strategies after this break. Are you looking for a career change or a life change? That is the mission behind Simple Wholesaling, the leading provider of discounted properties in Indianapolis. Simple Wholesaling is all about making the process simple for buyers of properties, sellers of properties, and members of the central Indiana community who want to generate wealth, free up time, and then help you use that wealth and freedom to make a difference in the world. Check them out at www.simplewholesaling.com or email brian at simplewholesaling.com or call 317-494-7211. Is this you? You've heard about landlording and you love the idea of a steady stream of income from real estate, but you're concerned about tackling the 2 a.m. calls and worrying about renters who don't pay their rent on time? That's where the pros at Ethosity Property Management take the hassle out of investing for you. They handle the toilets and tenants for over 300 local rentals and are happy to help you with yours. Call Sterling at 888-212-3764 or check out www.ethosity, that's E-T-H-O-S-I-T-Y-P-M.com. Are you wanting to get started investing but don't know what to do first? Maybe you took one of the national guru classes but you're still confused. Our members are doing business locally and they remember that they were beginners at one time too. Start by joining the biggest and oldest real estate investment club in central Indiana. Take our classes and network with people who love what they do and are willing to help you through the startup stage. Check out Cyria.org. That's C-I-R-E-I-A dot org. And welcome back to Real Talk. This is Ron Watson, the president of uh, the board of directors of Cyria. And I'm joined in the studio by Dave Short, uh, Brian Snyder, and Sterling Davis. We've been talking about some creative financing options, strategies, possibilities. Uh, one of the things that I uh, wanted to circle back on was land contracts, maybe 
Brian, if you could give us a little bit of a definition on that, and then uh, we'll move into a couple other strategies. Yeah, so, I mean, just land contracts, um, it's just a situation where you can basically, so I know, Sterling, you might be able to kind of talk about the buy side. I'll talk about the sell side if you don't mind and stuff, but basically just a situation where you can, you know, sell a property um, with, you know, the buyer putting down a down payment and then just making payments um, each month for a certain amount of interest um, on there as well. Um, you know, the length of the contract is depending on how what the terms may be that you guys write up and stuff like that. But just another way to sell a property to somebody that doesn't have like a full cash offer or something like that, where essentially the seller can be the bank. Um, so it's definitely attractive um, because you're earning on the interest and getting back what you need out of the property. Yeah, and I think uh, on the buying side, what we see is um, uh, with it is I'm able to enter into a deal. Um, we, we're doing a deal right now with a multifamily. Um, and the multifamily had an issue because it couldn't get finance uh, because of the condition it's in. So they really struggled with selling it. So the way, the only way that we made it make sense is if we did a seller financing or a land contract of some sort. Um, and with doing so, the the seller would hold the the uh, the note still. We would do the work, get it to a certain occupancy, get it uh, renovated to a certain degree, and then once we get there, we would. Uh, finance or refinance the the, the seller financing or, or the land contract at that point put a mortgage on it pull our money out pay uh, if we had any private money or anything in there uh, and we move forward with that we kind of pay the people off and and move forward so it has been a great opportunity where we we didn't have like for example this building say is five hundred thousand dollars we didn't have to put up five hundred thousand dollars cash we put down a percentage of it fix use the other cash to fix up some things and then as we're working hand in hand to increase that occupancy because a lot of times with commercial world it has to have a certain amount of occupancy for a uh, financing institution to uh, to uh, put a mortgage on it yeah and i even know that you know there's a, a few you know buy and hold investors you know even single family homes that they could buy a property on a land contract and essentially their rent payment is higher than what their monthly payment is so yeah. it's it's attractive then to be able to do that and i know a lot of times too with when we're looking at from the selling standpoint is there are a lot of people in the city that can't necessarily qualify for a regular mortgage through a bank and stuff but they still are able to make payments and still you know are being able to do everything they need to the house as well as even fix it up um, and stuff so that's why we you know, it's attractive for us to be able to sell some properties on a land contract because we have tenant or we have people with people that are buying them that are, you know, they want me you know, those fixer uppers. They want to be able to do that. They want to be able to find that property. Um, but then also they're making great down payments or great down payments and great monthly payments. So and yeah, you're able to leverage. I mean, like I, I was talking to a guy that um, Brian referred to me. I think he bought about 13 or 20 somewhere around that from you guys and he he's really happy with his return because he has a cash flowing property he's able to buy double the amount of properties that he would with the amount of cash that he has utilized up until this point and it's just been a win-win situation well i've li i've listened to these two young guys ramble for the last <laughs> two minutes uh, on land contracts next week we're going to have a guy in here and i'm going to be on his side against these two guys <laughs> to tell us why land contracts are old school oh you know, no right just is not allowed to we're, come in. we're going in to talk about why notes and mortgages are better than land contracts and how they help protect our sellers and our purchasers but land contract is the standard today mm -hmm. that most people are using and we're going to take a strategy that takes it in a much more safe and and uh in today's world type of type of investor but you know, having said that, I'll let these guys off the no, hook today. No, I, I'm on vacation next week, and Justin is sitting in for well, me. Well, you now, need to listen. Now now I'm going to have to call in. <laughs> no, it's good stuff. Actually, we're working with Justin on a lot of our um, a lot of our land contracts, working with him to convert them to notes and mortgages to, because they're more sell to, to or more attractive to be able to sell them off. Right. So we're putting ourselves in a situation where we're buying a property. We can sell it on a contract or a note and mortgage and then be able to sell that note and mortgage or contract to somebody else. It encourages so, cash much quicker. Exactly. Yep. Uh, so we'll talk about that. It'd be very informative <laughs> next week, and maybe we can get these guys thinking properly in the future. <laughs> but, uh, there you go. Dave, you I know. wanted to ask you. I know we, we're talking about a lot of people. There's, I think there's a misconception out there of you know really what is a lease option, what does rent-to-own mean, what is a land contract kind of thing. Can you just give 
since you have all this expertise and you can shoot down our ideas of what we think is good, <laughs> you're just oh, give wise a, a review of uh, kind of what what really is what terminology works with all those things. Well, rent to buy is uh, sellers tend to put people in a rent to buy with the thought that they'll make payments on a rental basis, and then so much of their payment will go to to purchase the house, so they can accumulate through rent a, a down payment a down payment on the property, and at that point in time, they will uh, refinance the property and pay the seller off. It's like if the seller doesn't want to be paid off, why would they ever enter into a rent to buy a buy scenario? So that's a strategy that a seller has. Now, the history on these kinds of uh, transactions is that the sellers enter into it with a with a hope that they will buy the house, and unless they structure that properly with a proper down payment, they're just a tenant that you know probably I'll say is not going to buy the house it's just a strategy that puts a, a tenant in the place and hopefully they'll buy it what was your uh, I, I know we were talking in the break it was either Brian or you were saying like you would know in the first 60 to 90 days well based on if if you put somebody in rent to buy or a lease with an option for instance very similar terms maybe a little bit different uh, but if you put them in there on a rent to buy, if they've made improvements to your house in the first 90 to 120 days, then they've created equity uh, in their in their mind. They're creating equity in the house that they're in. If they haven't cut the grass or trimmed the bushes or uh, created what I call ownership ownership views on the property, then they're probably just going to be a tenant that you have in there. And they're not going to ever refinance that house and and take you out of it. So that's that's your key. If no improvements have been made in six months, then you have a tenant, and they're probably going to move out in two or three years on it and not buy your house. Yeah, I, I think the important part is too is making sure that you understand how that deal is structured. Uh, one being um, with a lease option versus like a rent to buy. Do you have to evict that person, or do you have to? Uh, foreclose on that person is is definitely a well both both uh, a land contract you have to foreclose mm-hmm. on them on it okay uh, note and a mortgage you have to foreclose right. on them a, uh, a rent to buy it's just an eviction proceedings right. you have to be very cautious in your document uh, if you do a lease with an option to buy we have two separate when we do a lease with an option we've done several of them over the years haven't done many lately uh, we have two separate documents one is an option to purchase that expires so when it expires then you have no obligations to exactly. those people right uh, and you have a separate lease so when they violate the lease you can file for eviction on mm-hmm. the lease and then at that point the option would expire because right. they violated it by not paying the rent right and the option money then becomes non-refundable where we got into where some people who have done this got in some issues where they had one uh, uh, one down payment option money they might give 1500 option money to buy the house and then no deposit of rent so we made the deposit the larger share of the rental agreement so if they violate it and you have and you don't you don't have to give the deposit back on a violation and and damages where they could tear up your house and if the option wasn't violated you might have to give them their option money back Mm. you know so you have to be cautious on how you separate that most people just get you know we have two separate checks one for the option money and one for the security deposit and i think you have to make sure that distinguish we've we've seen that uh, before as well, um, where even inside of the rental side of it, of what is that security deposit uh, versus what is the earnest money deposit? Right. It has to. If if you would ever go to court, it would have to yep. make sense Absolutely. and not be one sided on, on how you did this. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the the biggest thing. The second thing I, I see that um, is making sure that you really understand the terms. Um, like, uh, for example, when that balloon payment might be due. Uh, versus when 
uh, as well as what interest, as well as um, capitalization rate in which they're they're kind of quantifying that. Payment. Well, you have to term. You have to have a termination of of all the documents, mm -hmm. whether it's a year or two years. One of the biggest mistakes that I've seen investors, quote investors, unknowledgeable investors make, is that you know the people are paying seven hundred dollars a month in rent to be applied to the down payment. Well, what what you're doing is you're effectively could be selling the house to the person on a no interest rate loan. Mm -hmm. So if they made 36 payments at $700 because it's a three year and all the rent gets applied, deposit, you know, multiply 36 times seven. Oh, yeah. That's a big number. Mm -hmm. And it's basically now that's the option price of the right. house. You know, we always did twenty-five or thirty dollars as the, uh, you know, the the down payment of part of the rent. So that way, at the end of the time, now they have a, a sustainable down payment that FHA or VA will allow them to use or conventional. Where before, if you did seven hundred dollars a month, I mean that's almost twenty-one thousand dollars that they would come off the price of your house if your document was right. was worded incorrectly and there's a lot of those documents <laughs> out there that's that's a great point and i think that's why you need to make sure that you don't just pull the document from online and just kind of piece <laughs> it, fill it together in, fill in the yeah, blanks like you know i mean i've go. seen some very uh skeptical uh, like what it comes down <laughs> some to some sketchy things sketchy well, very sketchy no that's that's a great point and, and that that advice right there could save you a lot of uh, a lot of money time hassle and and pain and, and blood, by the way, too. Yeah, so, and blood. So we're going to take another break here, come back to our final segment after a couple messages. Insurance companies say they're going to be there for you when life happens, but the truth is things can get pretty complicated fast when it comes to a personal injury accident. The steps you take after an unexpected crash are crucial. You need help every step of the way. Hey, Andy, this is Dave Ramsey. I've been talking about the Randy 7-ish difference for several years now. For 34 years, Randy has helped thousands of people through their worst circumstances. Randy stands as a shield in between you and the insurance company. So even if you've started conversations with the insurance company after an injury accident, talk to Randy 7-ish to make sure you're not leaving money on the table. If you or someone you know has an injury accident, whether you're a pedestrian, passenger, driver, or rider, talk to Randy 7-ish first. Call 3 one seven six three six seventy seven seventy seven for a no obligation consultation. Seven ish law. Fierce protectors of the injured. Three one seven six three six seventy seven seventy seven or sevenishlaw.com. Midwest Garage Door Systems, Real Talk's premium sponsor, is a locally and family-owned business, answering your garage door repair and replacement needs for over 30 years in central Indiana. Doing business the right way is what Midwest is all about. Check out MidwestGarageDoors.com or call 317-449-8440, 317-449-8440. And welcome back to Real Talk. My name is Ron Watson, the president of the board of directors of Cyria. And we're in our final segment here this afternoon, but we thought we would wrap up a little bit with uh, the creative financing. We've had some good discussion around that. Um, and coming up at our next Cyria meeting, we're going to be talking about these types of things in more detail. We're going to talk about turning land contracts into more secure mortgages uh, and turning them into notes. And uh, we're going to have some people that are very experienced in those particular areas uh, so it's a good opportunity for you to come and learn a lot more about what we're doing there dave did you have anything you wanted to, to mention in terms well, of for that people meeting? that haven't been to syria the you know the first meeting's free so just let vicky know on our site that, that you're coming and we would love to have you and you can see what we do yeah i, I want to thank all the people that just has reached out from this radio show um uh, that has just wanted to uh uh, learn more about Cyria. Want to learn more about um, each and every one of us because I think that is uh, we couldn't do it without you know the people and the listeners. Yeah, I, th I mean, I, I look at Cyria. I remember you know I think my first meeting was maybe a year and a half ago, but just uh, how much number one the group has grown. How many we've talked about it on here of you know your first couple of meetings you kind of think of oh well I can just I can list a house and I can you know sell a house that way and stuff like that. But there's so many different options. There's so many different things that you can do and just learn about and find out about through groups like this. And I mean, Syria does a great job of 
you know, no matter what you're interested in, there's more than likely somewhere where you can plug in, um, get connected with people that are doing the same thing you are. Um, and I always like that option or that ability to have somebody that has been doing it for a while that is, you know, wants to help you out, wants to help you grow and things like that. But then also have some people underneath you too, that are like, maybe you can lend them some, some advice as well, um, based off of your experiences. So yeah, it's a great just community and great, um, you know, things like that. And this, this is going to be a great panel just because I think there's a lot of different things when we're talking about, you know, subject to we're talking about lease options, you know, rent to own land contracts, notes and mortgages. There's so many different options within that, that I know my mind is going to be spinning with questions coming out of that, that I know also that a lot of these people are going to be able to answer that are on the panel. So it's going to be a great meeting. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I, I think it's always good to get the panelists and the interaction of the information that they're providing and then somebody always has really good questions too that i'm sitting there thinking about and oh yeah I, that I, I was gonna ask that you know mm -hmm. so you, you always learn something uh, not just from the panelists but from the interaction with the with the group we try to encourage the participation from everybody and it's a really active group of people that come to siree in terms of real estate investing so it's it's uh, you always get people from different perspectives asking uh, really pertinent questions so hope you come join us and and uh, learn a lot from from that meeting as well yeah there is a lot of i would just want to put it there in here too ron there's a lot of great education and the you know the panel is always great the speaker is always great and you guys we give out a lot of good information but come to the meeting a little bit early too and there's a ton of vendors that are going to be able to help you out with anything you need as well um, there's one really good vendor i think his name is brian snyder is simple wholesaling that you should stop here about that check about out that. But, uh, it's a new one for me no there's a ton i mean we have a bunch of vendors and just it's a great community to be able to just yeah you know, like i said just reach out and talk to a little bit of everybody well the networking is what keeps me like you know what i mean like i, I just love meeting the people like I mean it like when I first came and I saw like you know uh, simple wholesaling and I saw this guy Dave who just seemed like he was just always mean and mad uh, <laughs> but he, and then I got to know him I was like and you hey. confirmed your yeah your, and I confirmed ideas, that he yeah. was just mean and mad no <laughs> I, I want to ask you because it's a little bit like this like, like oh my gosh that's Dave Short yeah like, exactly. he's like kind of a celebrity yeah, yeah, getting exactly. way <laughs> overboard here all right <laughs> Dave is blessing, I think. <laughs> yeah, but, like all I mean, right. Here's what we're gonna do, <laughs> so we don't have any uh, anybody erupt here. Let's do this. Let's Brian, since you brought this up, let's go ahead and have you uh, share your contact information if you have a tip of the day, and we'll start with you, sir. Yeah, definitely. Thanks. Um, yes, yeah, so if you want to reach out to me, um, best way to do that is through email at Brian at simplewholesaling dot com. Um, check out our website as well. We have a lot of great resources on there for you. Um, and uh, my tip of the day is just kind of we're talking about meetings like going to Syria and, you know, or different groups that you may go to subgroups or whatever. Uh, my advice is to be a contributor and not just a taker. Mm. Um, so feel free. Be that. Don't be that person that just kind of sits back. If you have a question, you know, put that out there because somebody else might be asking as well. But also look to see where you can get plugged in. Hey, can I help out with this? Can I set up chairs for you? Can I do this or whatever? Just be a contributor. Help out those around you. And that's a really good way to get plugged in and just come back to if you if you give a little bit you're going to get some out of it but just go with that mind mentality of like be a contributor not just a taker no that's excellent advice servant leader uh, sterling davis with ethosity property management uh, you can reach out at 888-212-epmg uh, that's 888-212-3764 um, my, my, my thing is um, that i want to be able to put out there is uh, really um, finding uh, coaches that can really teach you these things that we have discussed. I, I think um, I spend so much money on coaching, and I wouldn't be who I am or where I am today if it wasn't for my coaches. Um, so don't feel like you're alone at this. Um, don't feel like you just have to try to do this yourself. But there are people inside Syria as well as uh, other outlets that you can find that will help you through this. Um, and, and don't be afraid to spend money on it. Thank you very much, Joey. Dave? Dave Short, Century 21 Sheets. Uh, best way to reach me is email, which is dshort at c21sheets, S-C-H-E-E-T-Z dot com. And um, the, cyber meeting, the cyber meetings are great. You should come there. Uh, I'll plug my dinner and deals <laughs> meeting, which is the third Thursday of every month at my office, which is 4929 East 96th. And... We go in depth on two or three flips and strategies every meeting, where you can see how a flipper's mind might work that that week. Excellent, and uh, I've always heard it's a it's a great 
meeting to, to go visit. And I know Dave shares a lot of really good information there, so join him if you can. And I just thought we should say that uh, my name is Ron Watson, president of the board of directors of Cyria, if I haven't mentioned that 25 times already <laughs> during the show. But you can reach me at president at Cyria.org or stop by my restaurant at Trader's Mill Grill, 5650 West 86th Street on the northwest side of Indy. If you've missed previous episodes, you can listen to them on the Cyria channel on YouTube or go to Cyria.club, which is C-I-R-E-I-A.club, and click on the Resources tab for copies of all of our episodes. On April 4th, Cyria will be hosting our monthly main meeting at Broadmoor Country Club. We have a panel of local investors who use creative finance, and they'll be sharing some of the tips and tricks to do this successfully, legally, and profitably. Main meetings are open to the public, and you can register at www.cyria.club. Dot club. Thank you all for listening today. Have a wonderful week, and we hope that you join us again next time.